Okay, um, today we're going to be talking about the central nervous system, and uh, we'll look at some some specifics, and then we'll look at some generalities as well. Okay, what's the matter? In the central nervous system, there are both uh, gray matter and white matter. Well, what is the difference? Well, gray matter is known as non-myelinated matter. Okay, so non-myelinated neurons in brain and spinal cord. Uh, gray matter will not regenerate, therefore damage is permanent. Um, gray matter covers white matter in the brain. <clears throat> now you may be asking, what is myelination? What is this myelin stuff? Well, it is uh, white in color, right? But it's basically uh, kind of like a cell that's wrapped around the neurons, okay, glial cells quite often are involved, um, but it's a covering around the myelin sheath around a neuron cell. Now, white matter is myelinated nerves, so white matter has this white covering, but the unmyelinated does not. So the white matter uh, generally transmits nerve impulses more quickly than gray matter because the myelination um, speeds up the rate of, of uh, conduction. Now, white matter can regenerate, so that is an advantage as well. <clears throat> uh, white matter tends to carry sensory and motor information. White matter covers gray matter in the spinal cord. Okay. Now, I should actually make this bigger. There we go. That's a little better. All right. Now, the spinal cord carries uh, sensory nerve messages from the receptors to brains and relays. And then the motor nerve on, or the motor nerve messages uh, from the brain to the muscles. And this is basically what the reflex arc is. It's got your sensory nerves that takes the... Um, nerve impulse to the central nervous system, so the brain and spinal cord, and then you have the motor nerves that take the um, reaction to the sensory impulse uh, to the effector, to the muscles or the glands. Um, now the spinal cord <coughs> extends down from the opening in the skull called the foramen magnum through a canal within the, the backbone. This contains both white, uh, which would be myelinated interneurons, and gray matter, which is unmyelinated. Interneurons are organized into nerve tracks that connect to this spinal cord. So this is part of the reflex arc, would be the interneurons. So you've got the sensory neurons, the interneurons, and then the motor neurons in your reflex arc. Now, a dorsal nerve tract brings sensory information from the brain into the spinal cord and to a ventral nerve tract that carries motor inf uh, info from the spinal cord to peripheral muscles and organs. So if you're having kind of a look at this, you know, you can see that there is the, what's the ventral nerve uh, root. Okay, and we're going to... Get our little draw thing. Okay, so um, you've got your ventral root coming here, and your dorsal root is this side. Okay, so and of course you've got the same thing on the other side. Which is going to be, you know, your sensory input, <clears throat> and then your um, motor. Okay. So here's your brain. Isn't it lovely? Uh, so here you just have a cross section of the brain and um, we don't need to know all the parts that we see in this but the general lobes like the frontal lobe, temporal lobe, 
pons, medulla oblongata, cerebellum, all that we would need to know. Hypothalamus, pineal gland, uh, corpus callosum, those would be parts of the brain we would need to know. Okay, and here you can see the hemispheres, so the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. Okay, and the uh, right hemisphere looks way more healthy. What happened to the left? Uh, and in between you can see this longitudinal fissure, and down there you see a part of the cerebellum. Now, the brain is surrounded by three types of protective membranes called meninges. So you've got the outer layer, which is the dura mater, the middle, which is known as the arachnoid, and uh, the inner layer, which is the pia mater. And all of these are these meninges, protective membranes. Meninges, uh, or meningitis, so to speak, is the cause, um, or is caused by bacteria or viral infection of the dura mater. Okay, so anytime it says itis, that basically means inflammation. So it would be inflammation of the meninges. Okay, so meningitis, when you have bacteria or viral infection in there, which is bad because that's close to your brain and you need your brain. Okay, so here you can see kind of cross-section in the outer layer, the dura mater. Okay, and then the in-between, uh, your arachnoid. What's happening? Oh, there we go. So, arachnoid here, and then um, your pia mater inside. Okay, so basically, bacteria and viruses shouldn't be able to get past these these uh, meninges layers. Normally speaking, they they work quite well. When they don't work, then it's a really bad deal. Okay, so dura mater is the double outer layer over most of the brain and single layer over the spinal cord. It's filled with connective tissue uh, and blood vessels, the arachnoid, the middle cobweb layer with arachnoid villi, and the pia mater, the innermost, and delicate with connective tissue. Um, now, cerebral spinal fluid, this uh, circulates between the inner and middle layer of the brain and through the central canal of the spinal cord. The function of cerebral spinal fluid, or CSF, is buoyancy. The human brain weighs about 1,500 grams in air, but only 500 grams when suspended in the cerebral uh, or the CSF. Okay. Do you... <clears throat> Clear all drawing. All right. So uh, now it also protects the brain from striking the cranium. So you've got the skull outside of the brain, but the CSF is this hydraulic kind of protective layer. Okay. <sighs> There we go. And then you have chemical stability. So this uh, provides a means of rinsing metabolic wastes from the um, central nervous system and regulating its chemical environment. So cerebral spinal fluid is uh, important. Okay. So here you can see the blue space and arrows represent the cerebral spinal fluid. So up in this area here and around the outside over there. So they're formed in ventricles. That's where the CSF comes from. And about uh, half a liter a day or 500 milliliters per day is made, but only 100 to 160 milliliters circulates. So this would be a problem if you get severely dehydrated, then things like the CSF fluid would uh, start to diminish and then you would end up with uh, brain problems. 
Now, a spinal tap is when uh, the spinal fluid is extracted to diagnose bacterial or viral infections for disease like polio or meningitis. Now, ventricles in the brain. Um, here you can see diagram. Often, spaces in the brain filled with fluid that support or cushion the brain. So, open spaces in the brain is basically what a ventricle is. Okay, so uh, there's four ventricles, one in each cerebral hemisphere, one between the left and right halves of the thalamus, and one between the brain stem and the cerebellum. Three regions of the brain are the forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain. <clears throat> Now, in the forebrain, there are specific um, lobes and areas. So, the olfactory lobe is found in the forebrain, and this receives information about smell. Then you've got your cerebrum, um, which consists of two hemispheres. So, you've got uh, the right and left hemisphere uh, of the cerebrum. And do, 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 do. the cerebrum is basically kind of like the outer layer of the brain. If you think of it like the very outside. So it has a high surface area. Um, now when we're talking about kind of different lobes, the frontal lobe um, controls personality, walking, and speech. Um, the occipital lobe okay which we see back here in the back of the brain is contains visual information so sometimes if people get a sharp blow to the back of the head they can end up with uh, blindness or other types of of uh, <clears throat> visual problems your temporal lobe which is by your temples you know it's way to remember it on the side uh, this is going to be language hearing and vision and then you've got your parietal lobe which is touch, emotions, and feelings. Okay, so here's your parietal lobe, this blue area over here. Here you can see your uh, frontal lobe. Okay. Now you can see as we talked about the cerebral cortex, which has the, um, the outer portion of the cerebrum, I guess you could refer to it is the cerebral cortex so it has a deep folds now these deep folds they increase surface area so that helps uh, you know provide more space for more neurons okay and then there's uh, lots of myelinated to end gray matter in there now below this cerebrum is the corpus callosum okay so as you go inside, you know, you've got your cerebrum area, and then you go inside of that and you get your corpus callosum, uh, which is a band of myelinated fibers that transmit information between the right and left hemispheres. So it's like a bridge between the right and left hemispheres. So the corpus callosum. And then the thalamus, which coordinates and interprets sensory information. So your thalamus is... Uh, like almost right in the center of the brain okay and below the thalamus is the hypothalamus and the pituitary well so hypothalamus and pituitary is uh, right in this area here all right <clears throat> now the midbrain is less developed than the forebrain it has four spheres, uh, acts as a relay center for some eye and ear reflexes. The hindbrain joins the brain with the spinal cord, and it has three major regions. It has the cerebellum, which coordinates muscle movements, uh, the pons, which relays, uh, which is a relay station that passes information between cerebellum and medulla, and then there's the medulla oblongata. Which regulates involuntary movements, uh, things like breathing uh, and your heartbeat. Um, 
blood volume or blood vessel diameter. So those kind of automatic things. Okay. The structure of a living supercomputer, the human brain. So here we're kind of uh, summarizing a bit. So your brain stem, also, you know, what is referred to with the medulla oblongata, pons, and midbrain. Uh, this controls data to and from um, other brain centers. So homeostatic control coordinates body movement, controls breathing, circulation, swallowing, digestion, uh, receives and integrates auditory data, major visual center in non-mammalian vertebrates, coordinates visual reflexes in mammals, sense, sensory data to higher brain centers. Uh, well, that's more in the midbrain. But anyway, if you take a look at the uh, brain stem as uh, an entire unit, it's if you get an injury to the brain stem, it's pretty much game over because you know breathing, circulation, digestion, swallowing, homeostatic control, which includes things like heart rate, uh, all of kind of your vital functions are controlled in the midbrain. So you uh, don't want to injure that too much. Don't really want to injure any part of your brain, to tell you the truth. But uh, what will kill you uh, most quickly is uh, brain stem injuries. Okay, then you've got your cerebellum. Coordinates uh, body movement, learns and remembers motor responses, salamus. Input center for sensory data going to the cerebellum. Output center for motor responses leading the cerebellum. Um, also data sorting. Then your hypothalamus, which is quite important as far as homeostatic control center. Uh, it's going to control your internal environment a lot. Like they, there's, It regulates what's happening with your internal environment. So it has sensors. It says, okay, what's your blood pressure like? What's your uh, blood osmolarity like? You know, all of these things that you don't consciously think about, the hypothalamus is, is monitoring. And then it adjusts. Uh, and it adjusts through using the pituitary gland, which is referred to as the master endocrine gland, um, as well as neural controls. Okay, so hypothalamus, very important for regulating your body. And then there's your cerebrum, which is the sophisticated integration. So memory, learning, speech, emotions, formulates complex behavioral responses. So your cerebrum is what makes you smart. So if you, uh, you know, don't, if you're an animal that didn't have a well-developed cerebrum, you would be dumb. Okay, but, Human beings have a very well uh, developed cerebrum, and that's why we're smarter than other animals. For the reasons, anyways. So, here you can see forebrain, uh, you know, which has a lot of the, I guess, volume of the brain. Then your midbrain, which is just in between here, and it's not as extensive. And then your hindbrain. You know, with your pawns and cerebellum and medulla oblongata. Right. And this is, looks from behind view. Okay, so most of the cerebrum, cerebrum's integrative power resides in the cerebral cortex of the two cerebral hemispheres. And here you can see, uh, you know, the frontal lobe, parietal lobe. Temporal lobe, occipital lobe, and these are all parts of, uh, you know, the forebrain, really. Okay, so on these lobes, you're definitely going to have to know. You will have to know what happens here, what they do. So hearing and smell, auditory association, temporal lobe, vision, occipital lobe, parietal lobe, you've got uh, speech, reading, taste, um, somatosensory cortex in your frontal lobe you've got speech motor cortex uh, personality 
some complex thinking. Now the blood brain barrier. This is next to the meninges and it is a network of blood vessels, capillary beds, uh, tight junctions between the two that only allow certain substances into the brain like sodium, potassium, chlorine, water, oxygen, carbon dioxide, glucose, caffeine, yeah, um, nicotine, heroin, and anesthetics, creatine, urea, proteins, uh, now lipid soluble substance like proteins in most antibiotics and neurotransmitters cannot pass through so there's not there's like larger molecules have a hard time getting through there which is good nasal sprays are an exception they can travel up the olfactory nerve fibers and bypass the blood brain barrier um, and that's how nicotine works too it kind of bypasses it um, in a similar fashion. Okay, so who do we got here? Whole factory. Oh yeah, so this is like a nasal cavity. Like you see these olfactory nerve endings and uh, they can transmit things straight to the brain. So natural painkillers, also known as endorphins. These are neurotransmitters that the body releases whenever a pain or injury is experienced. They are very similar in structure and have the effect uh, similar to that of opiates like heroin or morphine, but endorphins are many times more powerful. But of course they're present in uh, much smaller amounts. So when you stub your toe, you feel a sharp pain, immediately followed by numbness, uh, which is uh, caused by the release of these endorphins. Now, this numbness sometimes isn't so immediate. <laughs> Anyways, but eventually, if you severely hurt yourself, um, the endorphins are going to help you out. <clears throat> Now, endorphins prevent the release of acetylcholine, which is a brain chemical that transmits pain. So this reduces the pain signal in the spinal cord, the thalamus, or pain-producing center in the brain, and in the cerebral cortex by interacting with the opiate receptors. This reduces perception of the pain. So uh, it's kind of blocking a lot of the you know, sensory input. Endorphins attached to the opiate receptors to stop the pain information from being sent to the damaged tissue. <clears throat> now, some good ways, natural ways to increase endorphins. Uh, laughter. When you laugh, it increases endorphins. Eat spicy foods, deep breathing and meditation, acupuncture, um, listening to enjoyable music, chocolate, and exercise. Okay, so like eat a chocolate covered burrito, laugh about it while running on a treadmill, listening to some scallop. There you go. Okay, so um, artificial painkillers they repress the production of the body's natural painkiller. So when you stop. Taking the drug, opiate receptors are extremely sensitive to pain. So this is why withdrawal is difficult for drug addicts because they have all of these uh, painkillers. They're natural painkillers that are not in production because the artificial painkillers have been kind of taking over their job. They said, you know what, we're going on strike. And then when you go off the artificial painkillers or the drugs, uh, then you're like, raw nerves, stimulated, pain, much pain. Okay. Uh, so their bodies are not used to making the natural painkillers. I just said that. Anyway, so all of those uh, pain receptors are open and firing once the artificial painkillers are gone. 
so that doesn't sound good. Uh, depressants, things like Valium or Librium, enhance the action of the inhibitory synapses, so they repress the activation of the opiate receptors, delay the pain from being received. Um, alcohol is a depressant, so it acts directly on cell membranes to increase the threshold levels of pain. It's a little bit different mechanism than some of the other uh, depressants. <coughs> okay, so that is it. Once you have listened to this tutorial, make sure you submit write up and submit a tutorial summary.